Good evening. You have this terrible feeling you're speaking and then that's your bit you've done something really bad and you smell it because everyone disappears at the far end. Um, but anyway, it's, it's an unusual thing to be speaking in lecture theatre, but I'm really pleased to be here and welcome you to the first of the three mini-series of Good Lab Ideas for Good Events. So I'll tell you a little bit about the project itself, the purpose of this event, um, the agenda that we have uh, between now and uh, 720, 730, and the challenge we've set some of our speakers. Um, and then we'll move on to our first four speakers. So, um, Good Lab itself is a project which is supported by both the University of Bristol and the University of West of England. It's funded through By Hefty, with support from Unlimited, which is a foundation supporting social entrepreneurs. Um, but the purpose of this project really is to highlight some of those amazing partnerships which happen between higher education institutions, the staff, the students, the alumni, the PV that create, and organisations that create or how they can work together to create wider public benefit, to deliver impact in the world, and actually what that internet looks like, but also what we can learn really, not just from the what and the vision that we can achieve from doing it, but actually how it's done, because um, I think that's the really challenging bit which we want to learn more from and uh, apply to our own work. So Good Life itself has a few different strands of work. One of them is doing these events, which hope to engage an audience, but also start some conversations, which we can pick up afterwards and then turn them to strengthen existing partnerships or broker some new ones. Um, but also you'll hear more from some of the Good Lab staff later on about some of the work which is going on within Good Lab itself. One of those is actually mapping what's happening in different thematic areas. Both the work which is done by external organisations and also some of the academic staff who's leading change, who's developing the research which we can really apply to make a difference in the world. But also we want to be able to broker direct partnerships between academia and external organisations or emerging social entrepreneurs. So uh, if you want to speak to Julie Anderson later on, who also is director of social entrepreneur, social enterprise works, we have a cohort of um, entrepreneurs, and she is hopefully waving. <laughs> uh, um, so Julie has been working with a cohort of new social entrepreneurs, which is looking at some of the needs, not just supporting women's businesses, but also brokering links to academic institutions to help them further their work, and to look deeper into some of the challenges and some of the change they want to affect in the world. Also, we have our colleagues Molly and Rob who've been working very closely to map what's up and I'll be able to talk to you about your work. But also, if there is anyone out there which you don't already know about, we're really interested in hearing from you. And also, um, resources, knowing what's out there, knowing the latest on policy updates, seeing some great case studies, being able to go to one place for some of that information. You go to that website as a resource which is really built up for that. And if you haven't seen us, um, I don't know our URL absolutely off my heart, which is .net or .co.uk, but if you just search for that, you'll find it all there. There'll be a follow-up email with all the resources that I mentioned today. And why am I here, and, um, and, and how am I helping? Well, I'm working with GoodLab, because I've, I suppose I've worked as a social entrepreneur myself in the past, and we set up a couple of businesses, um, either in um, green energy or in creative and cultural regeneration. But also, I voluntarily run Bristol and Bath Social Enterprise Network, which has 300 members, and we work with far broader than just social enterprises, and we are there as a network to connect, bring people up, actually support them, to just access the opportunities they want, or access the capacity they need to meet those opportunities. And I'm quite passionate about this area, having worked um, with Andrew Ray, who's up there from the Home Research and the Press Public on one of the first um, Cabot Institute partnership projects with a social enterprise, the Stokes Croft and also seen how um, there's a real need to get it right in terms of how large organisations and smaller social businesses can work together to get things done. Um, and very fortunate to be part of a couple of projects where I've learned a huge amount of things. Um, so when it's not about me and, and what we do, we'll be hearing a little bit more about that later. Um, I'd like to talk about our speakers. We've got four speakers, three of them are academic, and one of them is leading the social business. Um, we have set on an unusual challenge at this time because we wanted to have a more fluid way of presenting ideas um, and we wanted to, uh, to be short and sharp and also to uh, encourage people to look at the, the why behind their work and also the how. So we asked them to do Petra Kucha in our presentations. Now for those of you which are not familiar, this is um, a form of presenting which is there as a short, short sharp way of presenting ideas. It is so images only, it's 20 seconds per slide, it is timed. So it is a bit of a challenge, and for some of our speakers, it's the first time they've done it. So I'm really, really grateful for them to, to stepping up to this. There's one exception to this, which is um, Lauren and Stephen, um, who are co-presenting. It's very difficult to do that as a pair, so we, we let them off. I'm sure that it's quite 
excited um, and the, um, we've given them the same brief as the rest of the speakers. So that's enough about the transfer set of speakers. I'm really pleased to welcome our first speaker to this day, which is Sarah Griffiths. Sarah works in the Experimental School of Psychology in the University of Bristol and she's going to tell a bit about the partnership that she has started uh, and developed with the organisations to create a tech application supporting young people with emotional recognition um, and combating some of the challenges of autism. We're much better placed to uh, start yourself. So if you're ready, yep. fire away. So, um, as I just said, I'm going to talk about collaboration between myself and others at the School of Experimental Psychology here at the University of Bristol. Nigel Direct is an independent app developer and School for Children with Special Educational Needs in North Somerset. The aim of the project is to develop an app for teaching children to recognise emotion from other people's facial expressions. It's particularly for use for children with autism spectrum disorders and it's used in a school setting so we support from the teacher. As many of you might know, autism is a developmental disorder which particularly affects children's um, social development. One important part of social development is learning to recognise non-verbal communication behaviours, such as facial expressions. And for this reason, children with autism are often taught in schools about emotions, um, including facial expressions, using flashcards. The images on flashcards are often sort of simple drawings of face and facial expressions, such as these ones. And this, this collaborative, collaborative project really started a conversation between um, a teacher of children with autism and our app developer. And the teacher was saying that um, it would be really good to have an app for teacher for use for displaying this type of expression, but it would be much better to have um, realistic pictures of people's faces in the app. And that's kind of where our work comes in, because in, for our research into facial expression processing, we've developed some images such as this one, which is um, an average um, picture of somebody's face, goes through a number of different people's faces, which creates clear images of people's expressions and gets rid of some of the weird variation like the haircuts. <laughs> so, the other thing that we do for our, um, for our research in here is to um, change the intensity of the facial expression. So you don't do that by merging ambiguous facial expressions, such as the one um, on this side, um, with clear expressions such as the, the angry expression on this side of the screen, to create different intensities, which allows our measures to be more sensitive to different ability levels. So Nigel took these images and put them into an app which he thought could be useful for teaching emotional expression. So there's four sort of games in the app at the moment. The first one just shows uh, a picture of the um, face and underneath says what the expression is. The second one, um, you're asked to label the expression by pressing a button, which matches the face. The third one, you see one face, you've got to say which are two faces at the bottom of the screen matches um, in, in expression. And finally, there's a, um, a memory game where you have to turn over two cards which have the same expression on different people's faces. And in all of these um, games, you can change the intensity of the expression, you can change the number of different types of expression, and the number of different types of people's faces. So we then wanted to show this to some teachers and ask if it would be useful. So we started collaborating with Fosbury School, this is Fosbury School, um, which is a school for special education needs, which particularly um, uh, specialises in autism. The second thing we wanted to do at this stage is to get some professional help on design of the app. So then I, just a, uh, um, an expert in programming, design is a whole not another area. We really wanted something that would look professional and easy to use. So um, we need some money to pay for the design and to pay for some of our expenses for this project. So we applied for a pot of money from the Economic and Social Research Council, a pot of money called the um, Acceleration to Impact Award Scheme. And this is a pot of money that's just given to the University of Bristol to um, then award to different um, projects which uh, are collaborations between an internal university um, uh, academics and an external body of um, an external things such as the school or the actual. And we had help to apply for this fund from um, the Research and the Enterprise Department with Andrew Ray, which is a great source of funding for this type of project, which I'm sure you'll hear more about later. So, so far what we've done with, the, with this project, when we've successfully getting funding, was run some focus groups with the school. We ran two focus groups with teachers and teaching assistants from Crossway. And we showed them the app we've got now, and Nigel and I both went along. Um, and we asked them whether it's something they would use, and what they would change about it. Um, for use in school. 
We recorded what they said and we've done some qualitative analysis on the things they said. This is me trying to write down all of the stuff that they said, <laughs> trying to first um, attempt a qualitative analysis. But we came up with four key areas of things that they liked, disliked about the app and what they would change. I'm just going to talk through the kind of things that they said. So the first area we talked about um, was they really emphasised the sort of sensory overload that some children with autism have. So they said that the important thing with the app would be to keep it simple. They love the plain grey background and they really encouraged them not to add too much colour um, and animation to the app when we did the redesign, which is something that surprised me. The second thing we talked about was um, how to support children when they're using the app. So they really liked the fact that you could change the settings to alter the difficulty of the, of the games. But they saw that as something the teacher should be in control of. So the teacher would select uh, which game the child was playing and how difficult the game was. So they would suggest that when we redesign it, we should have the control panel with something the teacher did and then pass it over to the child when they were then playing with the games. Second we talk, the third thing we talked about was incentive. So how to get children to actually continue playing the game. And although they didn't want to add lots of animation and bright colours, which is something I thought they might want to add, they did say that um, having some, some more auditory um, stimuli might help. So they were just to add a voiceover saying, giving the feedback to the child and saying what the emotion was. The final thing we, um, we talked about was about how this app fitted into the bigger picture of what they were trying to teach. Because clearly, recognising facial expressions uh, is my area of interest, but it's actually a very small part of uh, a big set of social skills that the teachers were trying to teach. So we talked about how to build in things for the app and how to link it with other materials they already use. So now we're going back to, um, to doing some redesign. I'm making some new orchids and um, I'm recording my voice saying different um, emotions. Nigel is changing some of the games and adding some new games. And we've got the designer redesigning the app interface. The next step would be to take it back into the school. We're going to upload it onto um, the school's bank of iPads and let the uh, teachers have a go at doing it with their children. And we'll go in and observe how the children are interacting with it to see what else we can do to improve the app. And hopefully through continued collaboration between myself, the school, Nigel and the designer will come up with an app that is both useful and usable. So we're probably only about 10 seconds. We started it and then we ran away. So um, yeah, we 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 put up the challenge at the start. But um, we have four minutes for questions and I'm really interested um, if there's any questions from the floor. Just um, because I'm I suppose I'm standing up I can have that shot at it. Who who identified the need? Where did the where did the, where did the, where did the idea come from? So as I said, that was a really um, conversation with really Nigel, he knew a bit about work beforehand, so he worked with us before. And he was having a conversation with um, one of his friends who was teaching his special education needs, who said that um, this might be a useful thing to have. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's really very helpful. And mm. um, well, I was going to touch on this, but what was probably the biggest learning you took from some of the partnerships that you thought? You, know, you have an idea of how those things work out when you start, and maybe the different ones you sort of gone through a bit of blood, sweat, and tears to get back out. What did you learn from that? Um, there's, I guess, sort of some of the things I said are really about emphasising the how to design it differently for child adults and compared to a child adult. I mean, that's something that um, you might predict from, from knowing a bit about autism, but then actually the teachers telling us that was really useful. Um, and also, yeah, really seeing something about the sort of practical aspect of how to do it to the school day, which is something you can never have. Um, really being able to get it out for the teachers and thinking about what could actually have iPads that could be used, um, whether it would be a one-on-one thing, how it fits the curriculum, the SHE, that thing. Um, it will change, and it will change how it will actually design it. Yeah. Thank you. The question? On your phone calls. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Andrew. Um, do you have any sort of shared vision with Bossway about how the app might uh, be spread more widely in the future to other schools or, or what you might do together to, to get more users? Um, yeah, so Fosway, um, they're a, not the words, but they're sort of a lead school for autism in the area and they run a lot of training as well. So they have loads of links with um, other special schools throughout the country. So if you go to a stage where they're sort of um, happy with it, we would um, sort of advertise it through that network. 
as a free download for the, from the iTunes store so that people have other schools to go and start using it as well. I'm sorry, I'm not good enough to read your name, actually. You can say where you're from as well. Tim Bailey University of I was just wondering whether you have any plans to evaluate that uh, once it's, yeah, as you say, if you have got plans to expand it in further school. Yeah, so the final, the sort of final step of this would eventually be to sort of um, run some kind of trial that we're evaluating as an education intervention. Um, but I think this is really taught me that before you think about starting to do that, it's good to um, involve the schools and sort of get it to say where it's actually something that they could use as an intervention. Um, but yeah, that would really be sort of down the line. And then, and, and go on from that. Uh, so are you developing it as a social enterprise or is it still a research project? What's the stage? Do you, do you see it as that at the moment? Um, I see it as a research project. Sorry. Just to find social enterprise for me. Oh, purpose-driven business which um, takes the majority of its profits and reinvests that to further yeah. the social mission. So we do have an idea that perhaps another part of this project might be to have a, down, um, a downloading version for not the school but for um, parents or other people, which would um, have a small cost to it and then um, to go back into um, developing of the app. Um, that's something we sort of would explore as a slightly different um, um, yeah, the one of schools is reasonable. It's going to be free um, and for our own research purposes. Thank you. One last question. Have you seen any impact, um, early impact at all on the students that you might have um, So we, at this stage, we haven't tried it. Yeah, we haven't actually tried yet with any students. We, we sort of talked to the teachers. Um, we get once we've done the redesign, which we'll probably do in the next few months, hopefully before the summer, we're going to take it back into schools. Um, and then we will sort of see how the children actually uh, get on with it and see if the teachers think that it's something that's um, useful for them. Fantastic, thank you. I'll go on since it's really quick. Uh, yeah. It's not anything directly related to the app development, what do you mean you collaborate with outside partners? Um, but it's really useful, I guess. <laughs> <coughs> about when we're talking to different partners, like the, when you're a designer, you're going to have slightly different um, set of vocabulary compared to another teacher, and that sort of thing. Um, it's going to be interesting for me. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, it's, it's quite fun, I've got to say. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's very useful. Um, turn the pause again. <laughs> So really pleased to welcome to the stage. Um, you'll be able to put your presentations in a way where you can see the two years of slides and deal with your automation. Um, you should be able to make it yourself just because you're good. So Dr. Lauren, I don't need to do the introductions really. I'm Bristol Walsh, but also your co directors of another institution. Right? Yeah, yeah, we're co directors of the Bristol Walsh Institute of Technology and Science, which is based in Manchester. Expert Evidence Network. Um, from that rather sort of lengthy named um, idea, um, we started to realise that some of the research that we've been involved in uh, both together and separately for a number of years probably had quite a lot of potential um, for doing some social good. So, what we want to talk about tonight, just in the few minutes we've got, um, not in a petrificature format, because I think uh, get, as soon as you hear our subject area, you'll understand why pictures for our area might be quite difficult. Um, it's just to talk a little bit about how we set up our social enterprise initiative, where our fundings come from, how we started to establish partnerships, and where we see the project going next, because we're still in fairly early stages, but um, we've had some fairly encouraging results. So we're maybe in a slightly different format. First thing um, I want to explain is that our area of interest is child protection and safeguarding and for that reason it's possibly slightly different to find appropriate pictures. Um, so what we've done is we've just put a few graphics and uh, online together to try to illustrate what we're doing. Um, a number of research projects that we've 
worked on really originated with my doctorate um, a few years ago and monograph and then some funded work um, that's come by um, University of the West of England um, in the form of an early career research grant which was followed by a major ESRC transformative research grant led us to feel um, there's got to be more of a practical application of our research than sitting in a dark room and writing academic papers um, for ref publication purposes. So we can see the idea of a safer initiative. Um, tentative name at the moment, we might think of a better one. Um, we had to have some name to get off the ground. It stands for, um, it's not very impressive, but support after uh, family education based referrals. Referrals meaning uh, families being referred from schools to social services for child protection safeguarding assessment. So what this little graphic is supposed to show is that we have our theoretical research background. Um, both of our research areas focuses very much on state intervention, private life, the extent to which we all have private rights to stop it, state interference. Um, balanced against the need of the state to be able to interfere into our private lives to protect children. We wanted to apply that research. We wanted to set up a project, work with partners. We're very much about trying to feedback our research findings to the community. We want to just explain at the end of our talk um, what we learned and what the next steps are in relation to funding and partnership working. So, what is the Safer, Safer Initiative all about? Well, it's a lot more than theoretical research. Um, we can write an awful lot of papers about um, the interface between the Children Act 1989, the government, um, individual children and families. What we wanted to do is do a little bit of empirical work um, with local schools to find out how child protection is working on the ground, so to speak. That was our early career researcher grant. Um, we set up a project called Safer Children. And we went and we interviewed teachers about the child protection training that they were receiving. How were they trained? Who was providing it? Who was funding it? How is it working for them? And we got some results that surprised us. And considering I've got a doctorate in the area, that wasn't something I was expecting. I didn't know, for example, that child protection training is paid for out of individual school budgets and individual local authority budgets to private providers with no quality assurance, no auditing, no checking. Teachers are doing the training and they're feeding back that although they're very willing and wanting to protect children, they're frankly confused. And in fact, one of the best quotes we got from research was the IT manager of the local academy. He said, well, even a given could take this training and score 100%. It doesn't mean you can then want to protect children. That was really where we conceived the idea. We thought there's got to be a better way of feeding our research results directly back to the community. So what we did is identified at the end of that funded project um, what we saw as two welfare gaps. One is the provision of the training itself in schools. And secondly, we think, as importantly, the families, once they're referred into children's social care departments, are then effectively left to be subjects of assessment with very little support. And of course, as you might imagine, an awful lot of potential stigma. One of the really shocking findings from our research is that contrary to what we think public perception is, over 97% <coughs> of child protection referrals do not substantiate any level of child abuse whatsoever. Couple that with poor quality and regulated training, and it mainly explains why we see rather sadly fairly regular serious case reviews into these tragedies where children you know, are. Imagine the amount of overload, 97% of extra referrals into social yeah. services, so it's not surprising they're missing the one to the real. So what we're trying to do is fill both these needs. How are we going to do it? Well, what we were trying to do was set it up as a completely separate entity to the university, set it up as a separate business. And what we intend to do, and we are actually starting to do now and see some good results, is create our own training package, bespoke training package that's research led, university backed, and sell that package to schools at about 50% of the cost that they're currently paying the unregulated private provider. In other words, we go and we undercut them. But we provide something which is a better quality service. So far from the pilot we're running, that's the feedback we're getting people liking what we're doing. As we gain credibility, um, we're going to be launching this nationally and um, we go to our follow-on funding stage. But what we wanted to do, rather than take the money as a profit, because we're <coughs> such an enterprise, we want to use that money, all the money that we're making, over and above maintaining the training, 
to feedback to support the families that are referred. Because once a family is referred, they're often left on some kind of limbo, suffering a very stressful period in their lives. Okay, so we're trying to address that dual need. So effectively, one of our selling points of our product behind our training is not only do we think we can provide it um, in a better way than it's currently available, but from a school's point of view, they know that any money they pay is going to be fed directly back to fulfil the social needs. So that's really where we're coming from. In terms of the project, project structure and aims, it's really trying to get it set up as a mean business for this pilot year. Yeah, and it's not sustainable as well. And if you think Absolutely. about, uh, um, you know, there's, there's 20,000 schools in, in, in England. Um, if we can make it pay for itself with a thousand schools, the rest can really be plowed back into the social support of families who are living further in. And be really self sustainable rather than having to keep going back to government and thinking they have more funding. Yeah. Amazingly, um, we found that we can actually start the project on £3,000, which seems a ridiculously small amount of money. But just with that amount of stuff and funding that we've been given, we've managed to get the product and we're now working with the partner school to pilot it. So that's a little picture of uh, our, our partner academy, or one of the buildings of the partner academy. Um, they very kindly offered, um, I have to say with some enthusiasm, to stop paying their private provider to use our product to pilot it with their teachers, stress test it for us. If there's any problem, we're going to know about it very, very quickly, and give us some proper evaluative feedback um, at the end of the pilot year. From there, with our external website, our publicity contacts, our partners we work with, we do work with the NSPCC, um, Action for Children, um, we've got fairly extensive research network contacts. Um, we will be hopefully launching um, the project um, on a national level. We want to do a hub and spoke arrangement where you basically um, works as the hub and academics and other universities that want to be involved can access the spokes with us with our project. So what have we learned? What are our next steps? Well, as we say, we're in the early stages of the pilot, but so far so good. Um, what's amazing is we're finding so much enthusiasm out there in the community for what we're doing. We thought we'd, we, we, we would either just have a total lack of interest or we'd say, we'll be searching why you're out here doing this, but that's not been the case. What we think is really important, what we've learned so far, is we've got to establish and keep establishing it. Establishing that there's a genuine need for what we're doing, rather than simply say, as researchers, we think there's a need and that's enough. We need to actually keep providing our research evidence for what we're doing to, uh, to keep justifying what we're doing. If we can do that, I think our partnership network um, will widen. I think what we're learning is as a social enterprise, it's easier than we thought to actually break into the idea that we can do social enterprise work. And uh, we certainly feel that our, our, our partnership network is already starting to widen just through word of mouth. Next step um, is the regional launch, and then after that is the national launch. So really coming back to where we started, um, this is really our little mini journey of how we moved from purely theoretical doctrinal legal research out into the real world, trying very hard to bring some application and practical sense for social good out of the work that we're doing. Thank you. But no, it was it was a really strong presentation, a really interesting insight into uh, where you want to take research and application, and you actually find you have to choose the right kind of business vehicle to do that. Um, and I suppose I'm, I'm interested in that decision point because that's one of the reasons we asked you to speak is because that journey up to pitching for the funding and getting some seed funding to start up a social enterprise. It's actually a kind of journey where you've mm -hmm. so much there's a big story to tell. But did you look at other sort of business vehicles for taking the idea and the services forward? I think for, I think for us we realised early on that trying to start something in the community as researchers wasn't really possible unless we ran it as a, a, a totally separate entity from the university. Um, but we were obviously very heavily linked to the university and obviously you know, the fact that the other universities. Yeah, it's, it's very hard. difficult when you, I mean, this is a particularly difficult area and you need to sort of encapsulate it in something that's a little bit more protected. Universities, as soon as you start talking about anything, what you're dealing with the, the, the you know, 
real life people, I think the committees immediately stop saying, well, how are you going to do it? It's not a research project on people in schools. This is just saying, ah, our research is applicable in schools. Um, what they're doing at present isn't particularly impressive. There are consequences for all teachers, uh, families of the children, um, society. Um, if you put it in something which is just another private provider, but it's actually managed in the way we're feeling for the research in, and hopefully it's, it, it, it's good and we can avoid all those. It isn't research, we're not doing research on kids, we're just applying research. And so you want to call over the government to that entity? I also want to do it in a fairly agile way. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if we really. I mean, all research councils now, they, they ask you when you do a research grant. We've got, got plenty of money to do the research, but they say, oh, what's your pathway to impact? And you go, oh, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to produce papers and various other things. <laughs> but we've already done this project in a school, and we're really shocked at the quality of what's actually being taught to teachers in school about child protection. But we know what the consequences are of those bad decisions and bad referrals to both social workers and to society and those families. And you go, well, who helps these families? So then we sort of, just sort of distilled it into, into, we really need to do something which will support. I when not look at any other providers, it, it's not quite um, as independent as you'd like it to be. It needs to be something which is, you know, um, clear, clearly got a, got, a, got a genuine pedigree. It's actually coming from somewhere which has got a, a, a no-profit element to it. It's going to continue on. Um, I hope we provide a, 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 an ongoing research led focus for it. Um, yeah, this is it, it's, it's complicated business, but um, it's only chose the right tool for the job. Yeah, I, I, well, I don't think chose we chose it, or it chose us because yeah. it just sort of dropped out of a number of things you're doing. But sometimes good, you know, good ideas can happen that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Carl Benzer, um, Social Enterprise Works. Um, a sort of two-fold question for you uh, guys, really. Firstly, is it about that sort of the process of spinning out a social enterprise from a university, um, lessons for other academics in your fields that, that might wish, might have a burning idea to apply some of their research and, and how sort of lessons you might want to be able to share with others on that particular level. And the second is in the practical thing about expanding into schools. Um, what the easiest of uh, places to sell services into? What are your thoughts on, on how you might successfully look to secure um, uh, partnerships with schools, hugely nationally, etc.? Um, if I answer the second part of the question first, um, the rationale of working directly with a particular school in the area was that if we could get in through the door, so to speak, and get them to pilot it, um, and obviously we're offering it to them free of charge in order for them to, to stress yes, this for us, incentive which they're very happy to have. Um, that in itself um, has got the toe in the door, so to speak. Having got um, the Board of Governors on board, and that particular Board of Governors is um, setting up um, a, an academy federation, which effectively means they'll become the umbrella um, Governors Federation for the other schools in the area. So we deliberately chose a school when we knew that was happening and we felt that their network contacts would, would help us as well. I think as academics research in the field, um, we've also got a number of research contacts, for example, Ofsted inspectors, people who are very closely connected with the school, obviously organisation like the MSPCC, they can also put us in touch with other people. What we're really hoping is that as a combination of using those research contacts and a bit of publicity via the website we're setting up, um, the attraction to schools will be that we're research-led university bound and that we already have some existing relationship and not starting cold. I think we perceive that as the most difficult thing. If we could prove we'd evaluated the project, how can we possibly expect anybody to pay for it? So In terms of advice for anybody wanting to try and start social uh, enterprise from their, their research, um, it doesn't necessarily um, come to you straight away. I think if you get out there with people who you know your research is affecting, ask them what their problems are. It's amazing that you get back. Um, that's all we really do. I mean, we asked the question because we wanted to run a, a small pilot project to get some uh, quality, quality uh, data just to, to lead off into something else. But in actual fact, it drew us back into the problems that they experienced. So, <coughs> It's amazing what you find out when you go and you talk to the people that you think the research might have, might have influenced.
So last question, I call Sorry, uh, we'll have to move on that time. Right. Paul Spencer from the UE Graduate School. Um, so I've had a bit of recent experience of this training about uh, child protection because outside of my work, I'm a counsellor of one of those uh, academy uh, board of governors, if you like. And I can see a potential here of somewhere else that you can have impact because one of the, one of the reasons that the, the, the training is so lousy is because the government keep moving the goalposts. So when the government changed from last, the, the, the guidance on, on a safeguard went from 300 pages to 18 pages, and it became much more uh, locally focused. So maybe you could work with other researchers who have uh, knowledge, expertise, and, and influence the policy makers to stop them bothering about with the gold coast. <laughs> and that, maybe that would make a more stable kind of environment in which your training will really kind of uh, do a foot on. I'm really delighted that you made that point. Actually, um, you, you put it much better than I could put it myself. Yes, it would be wonderful to sort of bothering about with that particular policy document and um, working together, which continually is rehashed with yet more policy guidance, which people find understandably very difficult to follow. And ultimately, um, the aim of our ESRC funded research stream is to influence policy in that direction. What, what our dream would be is if we can find some synergy between the social enterprise, the policy influence, and who knows where it will go next, and hopefully something really beneficial to society. Thank you so much, it was really insightful. Sorry for those questions we now have time for. A bit of time to break, we must have a bit of time for discussion um, after the break as well. So, we're pleased to introduce Tom Sterling here, who's been in the comments of the OIC senior reading fellow. Are there any questions? I'm here, yeah. Oh, he's just a reader. I'll have to tell you another day. So, yeah, um, this is a really interesting project where we have to bring literacy to work, which is really embedded in. Communities. I'm quite close to where I live actually, Lance Hill, so not far from where I live in the Eastern and Barton Hill, and a community group which I've met in the past. And Nick's here this evening, I did a community action, and um, who I met about two years ago, we're doing a bit of work in Temple Key um, and, and looking at collaboration. Um, but this is a really interesting example of how value from within higher education institutions can be a starting point, but then they can step back and actually let people go in communities and some of the organisation that can actually take that forward on their own terms. Um, so Tom's got the first place to show us in detail than I am, but um, are you ready on the timings and you're happy to go when we are? Um, Okay. Yeah, and right. um, well, I'm really pleased that uh, Nick Henry could be here, and, and perhaps Nick can join me for the questions afterwards. Um, I want to begin by talking a bit about Ideal Community Action, because this partnership we've had with them over the five years was actually initiated by Ideal. Um, Ideal have been based in Barton Hill in Bristol since 2005, <coughs> um, and they work with communities affected <coughs> by issues such as drugs, poverty, poor education, offending, and long-term unemployment. Um, yeah. I don't seem to have any slides moving on, or don't move on behind me. Should I do that now? Um, we have a couple of The Barn um, Hill area of Bristol, where Ideal is based, is part of the Lawrence Hill Ward, uh, which is the most deprived in Bristol and in the wider southwest, and that's why from multiple uh, measures, including child poverty. Um, and um, one of the interesting things I think is the kind of geographical relationship you get in any complex city, but particularly in Bristol, between uh, different bits of the city and including bits that are sort of populated by the university and bits that are relatively remote from the university. So part of the point of this map is to give you a sense of the relationship between uh, Clifton and Barton Hill geographically relatively closely uh, situated together. Uh, although in other measures, I think, quite far apart in terms of the kind of environment of those different bits of the city. Part of the ethos of Ideal is that part of the solution to the sort of issues that affect um, the communities they work with is an educational one. So there are two main projects, are Sharp Shots, which gets young people involved in filmmaking, and the Domino Effect, which helps adults develop new skills and then pass those on to other people. 
And Ideal approached us in 2010 through Ben Moran, who was one of our students. He was a student on the part-time BA in English Literature and Community Engagement uh, here at Bristol, which has a very similar ethos to the Domino Effect project. The students on that program range in age from early 20s to late 70s, and they are often non-traditional students, um, as they're slightly patronizingly called, um, within uh, universities. Um, and as part of the course, they go out into the community and share what they're learning with others in some form, often in the form of a reading group. Um, Damien ran a reading group at Ideal for two years, um, and this is his reading group. Uh, and since then we've had two or three students each year running reading groups with them. And that's then developed into other projects. So we've got PhD students from philosophy going down and running philosophy circles at Ideal. And we've also run short courses with them in areas like academic writing, creative writing, and oral history. One of the first things that Damien asked the reading group to look at was an extract from Charles Dickens' novel, Hard Times. And it was a surprising hit. As one of the participants said, I didn't know that was Dickens. And I think it's an example of how ambitious um, some of the kind of content of those groups and courses that I did have been. That's broadened the range of what Ideal are able to do with the Domino Effect project, but it's also fed into new activities here at the university. Uh, and in 2013, I was involved in setting up um, a foundation year in the Faculty of Arts, which is a pre-degree year, again, for people um, who may be coming from a, a non-traditional route. Um, and those short courses that I did have partly worked to, as tasters for that program. And I think that part of the reason all this matters is that education institutions are sometimes very bad at recognising the untidiness um, of our lives and the points at which education can matter within them. To give you one example, a student who's now on the foundation year, not the person pictured here, told me that the key moment um, that turned her life around after a period of addiction was attending the reading group at Ideal run by a student on our part-time degree. They read Maya Angelou's poem, Still I Rise, which begins, you may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. And this student told me that since then, she herself has got up an hour earlier every morning to read. And that student's now thriving on the foundation year, and um, we hope going to be in a very strong position to go on to a degree with us here at the university um, next year. Um, and she also, um, as an aside, runs the reading group at Ideal now on her, uh, her day off from studying. So that's just one example of the kind of virtuous circle in the sense that we hope this partnership and these structures are starting to create. Why is the university involved in this? Well, one advice for us is broadening the range of students we take and seeing them thrive. Uh, this is a selection of students who graduated from the part-time degree last year. They were the first cohort to come through that program. <coughs> and I think in that sense, being um, an engaged university, which is something that Bristol talks about on its website now, connects to everything else that we do. We're only truly engaged in that sense if the people we work with outside the university have opportunities to come into the university to become it as students, um, undergraduates, postgraduates, we hope eventually also as staff, in that sense to become the university and change it. Um, and Nick's always saying that this will truly have worked when we have our first ideal academic. Um, but this also connects to research now. Um, this is one of my colleagues, Gareth Griffiths, pictured at Ideal. And the project that we've been developing with Nick um, it's going to involve me um, going into Ideal one day a week uh, next year, funded by uh, Bristol's Institute for Advanced Studies. And the idea I want to test there next year is that I think there are kind of forms of experience and therefore forms of knowledge that are currently invisible to universities that we continue <coughs> to exclude because there are whole communities that are disengaged from universities and from other aspects of civic life. And so I'm interested to find out what kind of forms of literary criticism might result from working with participants at Ideal to choose certain texts and then to read them together and write about them um, together. Um, it only occurred to me as I um, was looking at these slides at the moment that look there as though someone's laughing at my idea. But I hope that that, <laughs> that image actually conveyed some joy and happiness of literature. Um, 
E.P. Thompson, some of you may know as the, um, the author of the book The Making of the English Working Class, was also for all his life a passionate and um, adult educator. And he once wrote, democracy will realize itself if it does in our whole society and our whole culture. And for this to happen, universities need the abrasion of different worlds of experience in which ideas are brought to the test of life. It's that idea that I think we're now exploring with the help of Thank you so much. Um, parking, I mean. <laughs> um, different worlds of experience are bringing together. I know that's part of what we're going to talk about all the different series of events and all the projects that have yeah, come out of the new project. Um, can I just, you know, what did you guys make each other when you first met? You know, did you see those options? You wanted to go? <laughs> you know, what did the, and also, when you, you start meeting some of the guys over, over in Barton Hill, you know, they're completely right from the university, you know, what's the point of this? Was there any of that, or was it? You saw it straight away. Sorry, joking, such a great question. Um, I did a master's at Bristol in international development. I've been wanting to get Bristol on for 10 years. Um, and it, just difficulties, we did various pieces of work with different parts of the union, more research, I said. And then just a mutual uh, friend introduced me to Dane, and he was essentially the key to why we're here. Um, because of the success of the reading group has then opened up my new, we, you know, we knew what we wanted from the university ahead of the game. It was just getting the opportunity and basically Tom and everything there has just come into our grand plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, you know, we knew, we knew what it can do. I, one of the key things is that I took someone from, from one of our trainers mm. that had a pretty extraordinary life and uh, just coming up to see Tom and it was the start of this process. And she, she was literally shaking outside. Um, she really didn't want to go in and I had to pretty much push it in. Um, and it was that was like the smashing of the glass, if you like. Yeah. We had a great meeting and it was just going on and that every time that someone comes up here, we seem to get about 15 people come up for a philosophy lecture. It just, it's sort of like, okay, I can maybe have a business. And that, yeah, even if they don't come here, it doesn't matter. It's like that bit's change. And that's important. There's a sharing of time on each other's batches as well, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah I remember mean, it's, it's like telling so many things in business, it comes through personal contact. So, if you read that in the event introduction. Yeah, I think that was crucial. And I, I, I think it's also about structure, so. I And mean, I think it's the dominant effect of structure in such a similar way to the one part of the structure. And I think that meant that we need to be talking about. And yeah, that makes sense. And we were able to sort of each other things that were really just really useful. Yeah, you should usually see, yeah. I think, uh, this is the key. Because I think in times where we've had that, maybe someone from the university, and actually, because we work with you as well, so we work with, we work with both universities, so when they come and they do a search proposal, and it's just not fitting, they've got their idea, and then we've got ours, and it's just not really fitting the time frame or just what we're going to create or that. Mm. Whereas this, it was. It was Exactly what was needed from both sides, and then it's just been really like acting to push this mm. as much as possible. Ultimately, okay. well, I think that's an insight actually to finding that for the match because that's a key point here. So many organizations I know have an outside of the university, so many great ideas from the university have an outside of the other so well because of, that, because of that lack of connect. Any questions from the floor? Yes, So um, we actually got some funding recently from Kerry Facer, who's based in the Graduate School of Education, um, to, um, for me to work with Nick to try and build the range of complex ideal has with the university. Um, and that's partly actually how we first made the link with, with Good Lab, 
Um, but also we've been making it with a whole range of other departments, including uh, dentistry, uh, management, uh, international development. International development. Um, so trying to broaden, I mean, in a sense, we now have quite a rich relationship between the Faculty of Arts and Ideal, but we've been trying to broaden that out in, into other departments. I mean, I think it, what I said in the presentation is, is really true, that, that the process of building that partnership with Ideal through the part-time degree in English was really crucial to the process that then went into creating the foundation, which now sits in the whole of the Faculty of Arts. So I do think there's a way in which that relationship with Ideal has now enriched and in a sense shifted all sorts of things about the, the pedagogic culture in the Faculty of Arts. Um, really do you do mind that? Please people up for you. Okay. <coughs> the, the guys that um, are coming to us have sort of uh, either they're not overly literate, uh, just because they haven't been doing it for a long time, or um, they think that they might be dyslexic, um, or just completely that confidence around talking but also their, their writing and, and reading. Um, the whole project is about belief and building it up and, and taking risk. Um, and so each person is encouraged to read a small snippet. So the, the person um, uh, this evening, so Rob, who is a student here, and also um, one of our trainers, who's co facilitator, they will read a little bit out and then it will go around and each person will read along. And recently we had a guy, he had two uh, objectives the of course, one was to write publicly on the board, and the other was to, um, to, to speak to read off, and he was doing that. <coughs> but another guy who was this, like, well, the last two uh, rounds of training that have been dyslexic, and they've done it. It's, it's just encouragement, um, and just taking them so short and short through it. Interesting, you know, one of our recent uh, graduates, of course, her mother is um, an expert in dyslexia, and I'm in the process, she's a different bar at the university, and she's very hurried to the projects and they talk about it so we all understand it and also the Chinese understand it and then we can tailor um, the whole thing to it because it, it, it's something that comes up quite regularly. So it's, it's a tricky one but if you can get people to believe in themselves enough then they can break through that. Build their confidence. Yeah. This reminds me of my history lessons at school going around the classroom standing in the tone of reading before. Oh yes. Yeah, so right. <laughs> but in the right context, yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, but in the right context, because everyone finds it a nightmare. So it's gently encouraging, and the, the trainer who's been through that process will take them through it. So it's everyone's finding it difficult, and they encourage each other, and then you get a really beautiful thing that happens is that everyone's building each other up, and they type them through, and they'll read the stuff for them. It's just it, the group themselves train each other, if that makes sense. And so when anyone is finding it, it's like they'll draw them on, and that draws them on. So it's any difficulty becomes you flip it and it becomes a massive positive, uh, positive learning point. So, yeah, thanks again for an absolutely inspired idea. Um, and it, it, it strikes me that it is very kind of organic, very kind of something that happens out of a you know, commitment of certain individuals and a passion. Um, one of the kind of, I think, uh, my experience with the kind of social enterprise one is the first question you ask is scale. How, how do you scale it? How do you kind of produce that and transfer it into a different context? Do you think that that can be achieved or is it just about the project that you've got here? A recent debate for the organisation for Ideal, um, particularly with the domino effect, has been that. Uh, do you become like the McDonald's and franchise everywhere, at home, or do you go uh, an Oxford Cambridge idea, just for a wonder, I think, and become a hub um, for learning? At the moment, we're going for the latter, for the Oxford Cambridge, we're going to become a hub for learning. But the more we interconnect both in this city and hopefully with London and then elsewhere through various other bits that are starting to happen at the moment through things like the Christian Education Trust and so on, it means that we could be creating a model that could be really solid, that could be replicated. At the moment, I don't think it could be, it's not solid enough. And it, there is a lot of aspects to find out about how you could do that appropriately. I help you make a perfect look, it's always a perfect burden. But at the moment, I think I can corrupt it. And it's now about just making it right for the people we work with today. And in fact, we can now have them, you know, 
Um, just, just the same, same question from the university perspective. I think it being organic is right. And I think one crucial thing about the structure of the part-time degree is because it's part-time, and so the students do the degree over six years, the community project that they do is often for two or three years. And that means that they build that relationship quite slowly, but it also means they're really embedded in the community setting. It's not kind of hit and run model of doing community engagement in that, in that setting. And I think that's really, really crucial. In terms of whether it could be replicated elsewhere, Absolutely, but we are living through the complete decimation of other education, not only in universities, but in, in further education. So, I mean, it, it, in that sense, if it's, if it's going to be replicated elsewhere, there needs to be a, a very different debate nationally about why higher education is in my mind. That's a good question for you. How do you actually encourage community to take part in the, in the reading profession? In, in the degree? Well, what I think, I mean, like, how do you encourage the, the community? Because what I understood is that yeah. uh, you, there is a reading group run by students following the community. Well, each like, student develops a project that okay. should be related to the degree in some form. And the most common model and the one we sort of work with in theory is a reading group. But sometimes they do other things, so they might go into school and do one-to-one -one reading with students, for example. Um, uh, we, we have some students do something that effectively evolved into a local history project, although the history of that was slightly complicated. Um, in terms of the reading groups, the students often come with their own connections in the community. This is another option being local people who are kind of embedded locally. So, for example, Damien was approached, or Nuss being approached by Ideal in the first instance. We had other students who had existing connections to organisations like the Single Parent Action Network. Um, we had a student who um, set something up for adults with autism because that was a pre-existing connection she had professionally and so on. We had students to do something in their workplace. So, you know, in a sense, part of their task and what they're, they're sort of taught to do is to think about these questions about how am I going to learn, uh, share what I'm doing in the white community, what does that mean, which community, is it my community or am I going to someone else's community and then the, the, how do I find the people who come? So it's, in a sense, all those questions are asking part of it. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
And we also provide support to other people to help them make change happen and solve their own problems through social enterprise, doing things like consultancy, project management, and so on. Um, we've got a particular focus on schools and the educational system. So why is that? First of all, children and young people got massive potential that's underused. They're naturally creative and socially enterprising. And if we want a more socially enterprising world, we need young people leaving school that are confident, able to make change happen. And it's a topic for another day that schools aren't always brilliant at that. But we do a lot of work with schools <coughs> to help them become more socially enterprising. So, what am I going to talk about? Um, quite big picture, the partnerships between universities and social, social enterprises and when they're good and when they're not so good and what I've learned from that. At Rio, we've got a range of diverse relationships with universities. We're an employer, so we take students and interns quite often. We do knowledge transfer partnerships. We've commissioned research and evaluation from a range of different universities. Um, we provide real content for students and work with them. We've got universities as tenants in one of our buildings and we do re joint research with universities on things like health and cultural education. So, um, for the rest, I'm going to particularly talk from a social enterprise perspective based on all that work we've done about opportunities and challenges, food for thought and debate. So, big picture, someone's just touched on this. Um, what works best is when you build partnerships not based on slicing a finite cake up, but on trying to find the sweet spot in the middle between the two. Um, and that takes time, it takes a lot of talking and listening. And the, the first challenge in finding that sweet spot is that the size and the power and the cultural difference between university and social enterprise can quite often get in the way. And there's quite often an implicit assumption that the university knows a lot because it's a repository of knowledge. Therefore, how can I help you with my knowledge? You think, well, I know an awful lot about being me um, and what I do. And so how do you construct an equal partnership is important. So, first of all, I'm going to talk about opportunities and the nuggets of gold that I've got out from partnerships. So from a social enterprise perspective, I've got new ideas, I've got knowledge, I've got light thrown on things that I do that Rio does, and interesting spaces open up to me different to the driven norm of working in difficult places with, um, you know, challenge, basically. Uh, you get light and knowledge, it's beautiful. You get brand association, kudos and value, if you pair with the university, which is gold dust. You get people, direct and indirect. Universities are full of thousands of good people who care. Um, there's lots of good people in universities, so it's great to social enterprise to network with them. You can sometimes get money, time and resources. So this is for the social enterprises in the room. You won't get rich from working with universities and there's a long leading time usually before you can monetize a relationship if you can. But um, by working together, opportunities do open up to you and also if you're crafty about how you write research and grant proposals, you can write yourself in as a budget line if you're lucky to see you afterwards if you want help on doing that. Less obvious things you can do. The university can be a tenant, the university can buy bread off you. There's something big about how universities can open the supply chain. <laughs> From a university perspective, oh, I'm so behind that, most of the problems here. Um, from universities, by working with social enterprises, you get, you get real stuff. You get uh, the openness that comes with that, and all the people previously talked much about that than me. Um, so, the challenge is, you get Things to overcome if you want to form a productive partnership with universities. There's misunderstandings around language, culture, and terminology. And there's sometimes challenges around subject position. So there's contexts where we've had university researchers working in some of our work with children and young people where the fact of the university researcher being there changes the chemistry. And you have to um, take them out of the way because it changes the, it changes the way. It's like an anthropologist visiting a village different village when they're there, it's when they're not there. So they're studying something different. Um, challenges around money in terms of who's getting paid to do thinking and talking, and that's quite often not me, but that's the university and that, that how we how can get around that balance. Um, size and culture is a challenge. So a university is a, 
is a gigantic institution. And really, we've got 40 employees. We're big for a social enterprise, but we're still a small fleet compared to the university. And I began working with universities thinking that they were more like classic, top-down, quite hierarchical big institutions. They're not. They're like a big institution, but they're like a mad basket of freelancers. <laughs> uh, where no one seems able to tell anyone else what to do. Uh, so we have to approach them like that. Uh, further challenges, ethics and power. Uh, I think people have touched on this, whose questions are getting asked and answered and why, and who gets what out of it and why, needs thinking about the informal partnership. And turning it on its head a little bit, quite often what social enterprise want from the university is, oh, you're a university, we well, can prove what I do is brilliant, um, and therefore I'll be able to sell it and persuade lots of other commissioners what, what I'm doing is brilliant. Um, but that's not what research is, that's PR and advocacy you're after, really. A university is probably going to come in and prove that what you do is complicated and that more research is needed. <laughs> <laughs> so, to finish, sorry, I'm about to say this is too short. Um, on balance, um, the relationships are really challenging at times and um, you will go bold wrestling through them. But they're brilliant and useful when they go, but you have to work really hard at finding the partnership. And the partnership can quite often be in odd, unusual places, not obvious places you think they're going to be. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It made no sense for the image, because I was trying to say it's kind of the whole way through. I want to create a separate event so we can just hear the backstory to all the images. <laughs> it was brilliant. Because yeah, this is, um, we use Better Future in lots of different events. And generally it's about someone talking about their journey, why they do what they do, how they got there. And it's a format which really works about, and it works when you're talking about a project and a journey. But actually, Matt's chosen to step up on something which is incredibly challenging to add lever into that format. So. It's really great if we gave it a shot. Yeah. And I've got some proper research in there, you see that? So I will get some up later. That one was too That was on my Winston Churchill fellowship um, when I went to Seattle. And Seattle's got some absolute brilliant um, street art. Very, very quirky, unusual street art. And I like the picture. That's <laughs> 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 You guys spent a while searching deep meaning on that one. No, one, one, one of That's uh, the wall of the grain silo in France. Um, and that reminded me of sometimes what it feels like trying to deal with the university. So, and you've got to get through the cracks and in there. And once you're in, you're all right. But it can feel like a big institution. You can feel quite small in relation to it. And there is a sense of some of them. And there's, there's a question is, you're one of the organisations which I see as being stuck with in terms of engaging our educational institutions and actually delivering a number of projects with them. And actually it is a really challenging process, I've been there myself, so why, why do you do it? You know, um, either in the wider sense, not just as a, you know, either in the wider sense in terms of your impact, but also as a business. Yeah, um, that's a good question. There's as, as a, a, a bit of me, my background is research, uh, and I've moved around from being inside universities to working in social enterprise and community settings. And I just look at universities, and I look at my educational experience, and I look at the wealth of, of sort of social capital and ideas and potential in schools and universities, and think that we're so underusing that on an individual scale and a sort of institutional scale. So there's, a, there's a bit one of the reasons Rio does this is because I'm bothered about trying to get to that potential um, and now we can make more of it. Um, so it's a bit of a personal quest. And then when you get the partnerships right, it really does throw some new light on what you're doing. And it, it's, it's just nice working with people when you found that sweet spot. And that's half the point of what we do, isn't it? And it's, it just feels nice when you get it right. And if you're honest and you found someone good to work with and you're a social enterprise, you sort of say, well, I can do an expensive, but I can't do Thursday unless we can find some money to make it happen. How are we going to do it together? 
So it's not like that we are selling a service to a university. It's like you're trying to form a partnership that's honest about what you both want out of it. And of course, for me, I'm, you know, and, and the people with, we can't be there and keep doing it on Rio's reserves, which are about 12 grand, uh, versus the university's reserves, which are probably a bit more than 12 grand. So how can we um, find the partnerships where we're both getting something out of it that works, and therefore it keeps going into a new dimension? Um, you don't have many of those, but you've, you've got to keep looking for those, I think. Mm -hmm. With the academic institutions I work with, so a grand will get you 50 days of academic yeah. And, 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 and it was really interesting what's come up again and again around that and mutually beneficial partnership and it came up quite a bit yeah, in the of Nick and, and so on. And is it in your process of funding that have you found um, it's a lottery and it has to come through what you you have to persist and engineer your own opportunity, your own chance from it? Or is there more of a method to it which you um, suggest other organisations looking to approach you? I, this is what well, I don't think it's institutional enough at the moment or systemic. You, you're going to find it more when you hit it off. And this was some of the previous presentations when you hit it off with someone reasonably senior who gets what you're doing and, and the win win in that partnership and therefore will back it and put time into it. It's a bit less institutional across the whole because you make it work with one faculty and then you've sort of got to start again with the next. So it doesn't, it doesn't sit across. That's that's the challenge. So the answer to your question is it, it tends to work more on an individual basis and I wish it didn't. I think the next step is a bit about, you know, like the model you've just been presenting, how that can become part of the fabric of what universities do. So therefore, when you're asking for that as a social enterprise, that sort of engagement, the system's naturally inclined to give you the answer yes, rather than sort of maybe and what I will see. Years, well, thank you. Any questions for Paul? Offer some more insight, really, because of, uh, I work in the university, obviously, and they are huge, complex organisations that are run by committees. So, uh, whenever you're asking for anything, whether it's a social enterprise or, or other kind of endeavour that you're trying to do, yeah. there is an organisational immune system that has its you know, default reaction of no. And so, the direct route is never the best route, and it has to be done indirectly, and you have to kind of present things and work with small groups of people, then present it to those that have previously would say no as a face concrete. So it, it is very difficult, <laughs> frustrating, and, and, and horrid. But I it can't do this now. <laughs> <laughs> but it happens in all spheres, even, even when you work inside the institution to get anything done, you can't go the most direct route. And so and there's this whole sense of entrepreneurship as a, as a yeah. sort of skills. And if you're good at that, if you're good at being a bit canny, if you're yeah. good at kind of like taking a, a, a convoluted route, then you'll be successful. Well, if you don't direct route, it always fails. Presumably as well, but in that situation, the system isn't very good at stopping you either. No. Yeah. Which is a good thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And, and, and the universities are full of academics that hate rules and regulations, so you've, you'll find lots of uh, common bedfellows who are quite willing to take the common route to group. Yeah. <laughs> I think, so I, I, I think it's, there's something about how collectively the social enterprise community and universities can begin to write grant applications differently. Because um, I've learned a lot about research funding by working in partnership with universities because I'm not a research institute so I can't access it. But um, it's been interesting working with a set of academics about how bendy it can be within the terminology um, and I, I think there's a set of practice that could be usefully shared there that would liberate resources for better partnerships because the challenge is when, it's, when the research grant's been almost stitched up beforehand and the person arrives going, we've got this brilliant idea, we want to do this with you. And right, well, why? I don't quite get it. And how's it going to work? And right, your time's paid for, we've got to go and get a grant to pay for our time to talk to you and that's going to take six months. But I do want to do it. There's the stuff that could have been done earlier that is just nuts and bolts work about how we apply for grants together to do research that's got, that, that creates win-wins and therefore's got a bit more depth the type you, you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that's a really useful man. There's some great insights come from a few different projects, not just one. So thanks. <laughs> Look, 
Because we had some fascinating speakers, but also the teams and really, I don't know if we can get some great insights into the questions. We are running a bit of time. Now, we've got about another 40 minutes. Yeah. Um, we're about to have a short break, then we can have glances to make sure we use up all the nibbles, because uh, that's what they're there for. Um, but just after that, I'm, I'm really interested in bringing everyone together in a more informal session where we will have some short two minute updates or pitches or just people standing up and talking a bit about their work. Part of um, the purpose of Goodman is actually bringing people together, starting some conversations, but actually seeing what partnerships we might be able to see um, from these events or from the people who are in the room. So that's an open session. So if anyone wants to come up and speak to me or one of the Good to start within the next sort of 10 minutes or three for like last and things. Just talk for two minutes, it's not four minutes, it's just to really share your work so that can start in a conversation with potential partners and let us know. We already have a few people together. Following that, we will just have a five, ten minutes of discussion on two things really. One of them is around different forms of support which are available to resource some of this work from within universities and the fortune to Andrew Gray here from RED, so the Research and Enterprise. Department, sorry, from the University, um, and also Katie Martin, who works for you know, the UWE and um, the research and business innovation, never got back in right, thank you. Um, we're able to talk a bit about some of the funding, but also Matt and some of the people who've delivered the projects we've heard something about, we're here to be part of that. And so if we have some questions we want to tease out for further discussion, but also we have any questions around some of the resources available, that's a place to put it. So come speak to us, we want to do a two minute pitch, and then following that, we'll have a quick discussion. I'm going to be set free to enjoy the remains of a very nice evening. So um, we'll see you back here in a moment. Thanks so much.